introduce Steve Watson and Kit Cummins, who will be talking about publishing today. Um, Steve started Stack, which is an innovative magazine distributor um, which helps independent publishers find a wider readership. And um, Kit founded Publishing Damned, which is a project for discussing and promoting alternative directions in publishing outside the mainstream. By no coincidence, Publishing Be Damned will be having their self publishers fair, annual fair, to, here tomorrow. So um, if you could come along to that, that would be great. So I did the plug for Publishing Be Damned. Yeah. You put the tea towel up the yeah, stack. Yeah, we, so we're, we're, we're fully, we're fully branded. I, I need okay. to say, actually, I, I just I brought Kit a mug and a tea towel. Just for him to have, and he's um, he's I now brand, branded I know the branded it for, so, um, for you, yeah. Phil philanthropic branding <laughs> exercise. Um, I don't know. Do you want to introduce Stack a bit more than that, or do you, should we just go into? Uh, yeah, no. So, yeah. so, um, <clears throat> so Stack. Is, uh, actually, so, who here knows what Stack is already? Great. So, for the, for the few people who who don't, I, I always I always ask before I do something like this because it tells me like whether I'm doing a decent job or not, and today, decent job. Um, <laughs> so, um, so Stack is um, a magazine service uh, for independent titles that are quite hard to find. So it is you um, subscribe, and every month I send out a different independent magazine. So you never know what you're going to get next, but you do know it's going to be a really beautiful, intelligent magazine that you probably wouldn't have seen otherwise. Um, and that's about the size of it, I think. Most people seem to know already. So yeah, well, I, I'm going to say that. Who knows what publishing down draws before you? Yeah. No, you're more popular than me. <laughs> uh, um, well, publishing me down, I suppose. Just quickly, Antonio's introduction was exactly accurate and wholly incorrect. In that, to an extent, in that those the way we describe things is often just the nearest we can get to what we do. Uh, it. Publish Me Damned isn't any one thing or one person um, that basically revolves around a series of fairs for artist-led publishing. And we mainly focus on magazines, although there's some bleed there. And the reason for that was there seemed to be a lot of regular publications coming out which had no distribution um, at all. No, it, There was just no way of placing them into the market other than hand to hand and I actually really like that but we thought it would be more interesting to bring together lots of those publishers mm. and so that they could do a big swap meet so it's more like a convention mentality um, than it is a marketplace uh, there seems to be a big demand for it mm. so uh, and I think it is partly to do with that like, it, there's a there's a gap somewhere in the supply and distribution chain that prevents a certain type of production being able to make it onto the shelves. Sometimes <coughs> rightly, sometimes wrongly, to be honest. You know, it's not a quality decision, but it's a, it's a certain economics that's at play. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, very simply, I guess, if you're looking at, if a magazine has to go into a, a shop um, and the retailer's going to take, say, 20% of it, they'd rather take 20% of a magazine that's selling for 20 quid than a, a zine that's selling for three pounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, you know, kind of there's a, a, an inherent kind of interest there. And I think that's actually a, a real problem because it kind of, it encourages people who are making magazines to make these big, heavy, beautiful, not always all that well thought out magazines that they then sell for the you know, 20 pounds or whatever it is. When actually I think part of what's amazing about magazines is that you can, um, you know, there's, there's very little commitment there. You can sort of take a punt on something for, a fiver, you know, you, you don't have to save up your pocket money to, to go and get it. And if you don't like it, chuck it in a cycle and afterwards. And I think that, I mean, cause I, I've been to a couple of uh, publishing be damned in the past. And certainly for me, as, 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 as much as it's nice to go and see what zines people are making, it's nice to go and meet the people and, and like feel the sort of atmosphere of, of you know, great buzzing sort of experience. That's my son at the back, so I'm sorry. <laughs> He's disagreeing with me. Yeah, I know, I know. I know. Like, oh, you're being so He's never even been to publish and be done. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I, and I think that's part, of, that's part of what is special about those kind of like those small magazines. The thing I get frustrated with is the sort of the easy acceptance of like, well, oh, you know, they're only small, uh, you know, kind of the... So it's fine that it should stay at that level. I, I think, no, it shouldn't. It should, you know, more people should know 
about these magazines because they're fantastic. And the, you know, kind of, that's why Stack basically was set up, to just make it so easy for people to get like a really regular, varied diet of interesting yeah. stuff. I, mean, I think that's <clears throat> also within magazine publishing, as opposed to publishing more generally, there's some very interesting trajectories from that grassroots up, up into sort of quite main, well, what I see as mainstream, I suppose. So like Dazed and Confused, <clears throat> and that was set up by Rankin, literally mm. came out of a student union magazine um, called Blue, I think, that was published by the London Institute, which is now the University of the Arts. And um, he was the student union vice president or something, and just used it as an opportunity to produce actually quite a radical magazine funded by the University of the Arts, um, which was then banned because it, uh, he did an issue of, uh, called Naked, and everybody was naked in it. Which was like, you know, quite, which lights up a lot with like, the Yoko and Teller show, kind of that, it was that same period, of course, with Enkin and, and those kind of journalists, photographer, publishers, whose roles aren't entirely desired, um, defined. But the Naked issue wasn't the problem, basically. The last page showed a sort of sequence, a photographic sequence of an erection going up and down, which is illegal. It like, then classified it as pornography and it was ditched. Like, uh, um, but he kind of took that spirit of um, a kind of quite anarchic and, as I say, mixed type of practice of photographer, designer, editor, into Dazed and Confused. Mm. So that, that, and which is obviously now quite a successful magazine, to say the least. So, um, and the same, this was the period, I suppose, I grew up and start, uh, it, as a student or then understanding about, as an art student, and like getting interested in writing, in visuality, materiality, and kind of also the spread of things, how things move from one place to another. Mm. And uh, so that, uh, those spirits of, um, sort of positions of directly informed publishing down like 10 years later mm, mm. Um, because it seemed like that stuff could potentially disappear in the face of the internet but um, although I don't actually think that's true I don't think it did but um, well I mean that remains uh, this this constant kind of straw man that's always held up of you know kind of <gasps> the internet oh no oh no people have stopped reading things in print and of course well, I say, of course, I don't think that's true. Um, but I, I actually think that the internet has really helped to, to, to spread this stuff. So, you know, you're saying, like, when Rankin was, was, you know, sort of like, was it called Blue? I think it was called Blue, if I remember right. So when he was putting that out, he will have been um, speaking to a relatively narrow audience, whereas someone doing the same thing today, um, you know, there's a, um, a, a great uh, magazine um, called Justified, um, which actually came out of a blog. So the, the blog came first, and it's, it's a digest of interesting art, design, architecture, things like that. Um, and they, they basically realized that on the blog, while it's fantastic for putting stuff out there, things get lost. And so you're like, you know, kind of like things slip down the page very quickly, and, and they go, whereas a magazine kind of becomes this thing that, that then lasts forever. Um, and also has to be a bit more rigorous because you have a limited number of pages, so you have to really think about which things you're going to put in there. And I think that's a, a really interesting way that now, you know, we're seeing people who have digital at their fingertips and may well start out with that, but then realise that print gives them something that they can't get. Yeah, I mean, it, it's nice that it's also yeah. like starting in a similar way. And uh, I mean, we started this conversation a little bit before we started this. So, um, <laughs> But I'm still, I, we then cut it off, think it would be more interesting to have it in the room, uh, which is about this kind of interdisciplinary thing that we were talking about how actually editorial and design and um, production, some of the most interesting magazines, and I think it is magazines more than other areas of me media, I think, often come from this sort of drive to understand a designer to understand the content as mm. well as the visuality mm. and sort of it's nice that it's all, I would say similar it's kind of starting to really discuss the design as well as being sort of like quite design led uh, so I mean the magazines you look at <coughs> do have quite a strong visual uh, visuality and materiality and a, a very well, I mean they're avant-garde 
designing the mainstream framework. As right. well. They're not like massively radical, but they, and the content sort of reflects that as well. They seem to be a holistic enterprise in that sense. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I think the, the word holistic is interesting because you, for, for me anyway, what kind of distinguishes a, a, a zine from a magazine is, you know, when I think of a zine maker, I think of one person sitting in their kitchen or bedroom or whatever it is, pouring their passion out into this printed object. And when I think of a magazine, I think of a group of people sitting together, pouring their passion out into this thing. And I think that the best magazines, and for this, I, you know, I, I include, uh, you know, uh, mid '90s FHM, which at the time was my absolute favourite magazine. That's the one that I loved. Respectable uh, boobs. Yeah. <laughs> Not so many boobs back then, you know. The Julian Anderson in her bra—that was what it's all about. But actually, what you know, kind of what I really loved, and the boobs were part of it. But what I really loved is that you got this kind of this sense of people having fun. They—they they were basically, you know, you, they were um, the editorial team where they appeared in photo shoots. Um, they had like a thing on the masthead every issue where it would talk about, um, you know, the, this month they are all doing whatever it is. And it was all about giving this sense of personality and, and, and what they were doing. And they basically just seemed to me to have the best jobs in the world. And so that's where I went and did uh, work experience at FHM when I was 18. <laughs> and, and had the best time. And yeah, it was, and so that for me is that kind of, you know, it's very easy to, when we're doing something like this, we're at the ICA and we're in a lovely sort of studio room. That, I can make myself feel creative in here and stuff. But, you know, magazines are, are they, they can be just as good in the mainstream as they are in the sort of like the more avant-garde kind of, you know, sort of like the experimental end of things. What I think is really important is that they have to have something to say. Um, we were, so we were talking earlier and saying how, you know, loads of magazines um, look great, but then you actually start reading them and you realise they're a bit of a, an empty vessel, really. That's when I think it's the team that, that is key. So if I think of like my favourite magazines ever, you get a great editor with a really singular idea of what he wants to say. You get a fantastic art director with a really singular idea of what he or she wants to do. And, then, and, and they basically come together and make something. Um, and that's when magazines become this kind of container of... The, Russell Davies um, is a, a blogger who I, I read quite a lot. And he was one of the... He sort of inspired me to start Stack. Um, and, um, and he talked about magazines as kind of uh, a good way to stay interesting. So if you read a different magazine every week, you'll be an interesting person because they represent these constellations of human ideas and, and perspectives and points of view. Um, and that, I think, is absolutely true. You know, if you, if you get the right stuff, then um, it's fascinating. That's why I love doing it. I mean, I think that way of looking that you've just actually more illustrated by your own excitement than necessarily exactly what you said, but the fascination or the curiosity, I think, as well, is one of the things that has drawn me to the, be interested in magazines and sort of socially constructed publications, I suppose. And like, I completely agree with you. I think the team element of it is mm. actually quite vital. And in publishing me damned, in a way, we've tried to both emulate that in the event to make it a social event as much as a sort of marketplace but also to look at how the magazine itself creates its own social sphere and becomes a place that allows content com it becomes a project that people can then invest in and come together and look through but uh, and work through and then present it and go into another social um, setting but also within the format of a magazine, that it's rarely singular. It's like, you know, in, it's a broad range of interests. And that curiosity of, as a reader to be able to learn about something you have no knowledge mm. about, mm. rather than the specialism of, you know, you've read every, well, I've read every J.G. Ballard book because I'm into J.G. Ballard, but that's like kind of a bit absurd because actually quite a lot of them same <laughs> to an extent you know they're nuanced it's like looking at painting practice where they're quite serial painters and one painting is you know you might like one more mm. than the other but they're basically got mm. the, the same uh, imperative behind them but I'm more interested in seeing like different stuff that I don't know about and having a shallow knowledge of different uh, of all these different things mm. and that 
there's few platforms actually that allow for that. I mean, it's a bit like channel hopping, I suppose, mm. but there's so little of value on the screen or broadcast media. <laughs> but at least, like within the written page, it feels like there's been some discussion and refinement. Mm. That's been mm. said. On the flip side of that, I think that's one of the that was one of the fears with the internet, which mm. has its pros and cons. Is that actually it's so structured around um, kind of networks of association that are dictated by what you like. There's the potential to get locked into Absolutely, these yeah. networks. You know, <coughs> magazine, you end up being a magazine person as far as the computer's concerned. Mm. So it shows you more magazines, and and you end up with this. The danger is that it can be a very narrow field. What I was I really like about the approach of stack is that actually it takes that <laughs> and then like, rips it up again and then yeah. sends out stuff that it's like, oh, you probably won't, you might not be interested exactly. in this. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Uh, and, and that negative relationship is actually something I think is quite interesting. And and that's something, so, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm not clever enough to have started out with that as like sort of the objective, but I've been surprised at how that's really been something that people respond well to. So, that, you know, you talk about like the tyranny of like the, the Amazon algorithm where, you know, now I, I bought some Sylvanian families for my um, little sister last Christmas, and every time I go on, it's showing me more <laughs> Sylvanian families. <laughs> Why do you think I want this? Um, yes, that you know, I kind of I'm I'm quite proud to say that I have no interest in what you're interested in. You know, the, I, I I'm going to give you something that I think is good, and and there's enough in there, you know, kind of the, because they're all fairly thick magazines. They are beautifully put together. There's enough in there that I can be confident to say, even if you don't actually like this yourself, you will pass it on to somebody else who will really appreciate it. And actually, there's a value in that as well. Okay. So in a sort of concrete terms, like there's also the, there's questions of sort of financial sustainability as well, and also scale. I mean, how many of these things are you distributing? Uh, just over 1,200 um, a month that's at quite, the moment. Yeah, that's yeah. still a reasonable distribution. Mm -hmm. I mean. It, but well, so that, that now is enough for me to be doing stack three days a week and other stuff two days a week. And obviously the, the, like the slow and steady march is like, you know, annexing more of my week for, for stack as we go. Um, yeah, and, and you know, it's, I, I looked at um, my original business plan that I very sort of like diligently wrote before I started stack the other day. <laughs> it's, just, it's like ridiculous, it's such a fantasy. You know, that I'm going to have a thousand subscribers by then, and and you know, I didn't realise quite how hard it would be. It's bloody hard. It's really hard work. But you get there there gradually. And the the benefit of having written the business plan is that at least there's a sense of how this is going to come together. So really, now it's just a case of growing it. And as it grows, it will support me, and then I'll be able to to do more with it. I think one of the problems with a lot of magazines is that they start without that, you know, kind of, it's boring. It's really, really boring sitting down and writing a business plan. And a lot of you know, people don't make magazines in order to manage spreadsheets. You know, they, they make magazines because they've got this burning desire to get something out. And that means that a mag can go out, and there's so much potential in there. But then they are committed to printing a second issue, and then they've run out of money by the time it comes to number three. Yeah. So I, I'm always kind of like warning people, like, you know, just spend a bit of time yeah. up front sit down and actually the so you know in terms of ideas of things that I want to spend more time on for stack one idea I'd love to bring together a bunch of um, independent magazine makers and make like an open source um, you know these are the secrets of making a magazine you know like sort of um, uh, I forget the name of the video game company now is it Valve or Steam who like they they basically like make all of their stuff open source so you can then go and, and make that game I think it'd be fantastic to do that with publishing. Really useful and, and save some people some money. Um, there is actually a publisher, my dad publisher, who has, or publishing project, I suppose, called And Publishing, which has uh, touches on some of that. Might mm. be interesting to put you in touch Yeah, on. yeah. Because they, uh, they, um, uh, they have a sort of online platform which, so you can buy one off ISBN number if you, mm -hmm. from them, and um, they have connections to particular types of printing that mm -hmm. are good value. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it's not necessarily a guide, but it's for tools to, it's for specialist tools, point, but yeah, yeah. Make, could make the difference between it costing 
you know, could knock a naught off the production yeah. of certain magazines yeah. by knowing this. And, and even silly stuff like this, so Anorak is a, um, a children's magazine that's been going for quite a long time now, and this year it's finally gone into profit. Um, and one, like one of the things that's helped it go into profit is they realised that if they made it 10 mil narrower, so one centimetre narrower, that then makes it a standard size, it will pack into boxes, the, it's a standard paper size, you know, to trim and stuff, and they save a huge amount off, off every issue just from that. And then actually, I should, I should say, we, um, I, run, I co-run a night called Printout um, every other month, um, where we get magazine people together and talk about this stuff. And the next one is the 26th, I think, of March, and that's all about the business of um, magazines. So if anyone's kind of interested in that, you can come along to the book club in Shoreditch. Just don't make stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that's print out. I'm going to print out of brand. <laughs> uh, but I want, I, I'm, I'm curious to know if there's, there's something that came into my mind there, but actually with one and a half, even with like 1,200 subscribers, a magazine that's on the edge of profit, if you suddenly buy one 1,200 magazines, it will significantly change their profit on that print run. Yeah. I mean, like, I'm curious well, on a practical basis of how do you, how do you go about? Well, yeah, maybe it doesn't. Maybe people wouldn't stop buying it from the shops or something. But I mean, are you going straight to the publishers? I mean, how do yeah. you, uh, is that pre even printing it? Or I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah it's yeah, kind absolutely. of quite. I mean, it's, it's, quite it's the it's the only way it works. So so basically, the distribution system. We sort of touched on this earlier at the beginning, but. The distribution system for magazines is rubbish. It's so, it, like, you know, you, so you, you know, the, the printer gets paid every time, the distributor gets paid every time, the retailer gets paid every time. The only one who's taking any risk in the whole process is that people who are actually pouring their heart and soul into making it, and that just seems it's the wrong way around. It yeah. shouldn't be like that. So I, um, I go to publishers <clears throat> and say, right, I will take, so, so, we're now planned in up till May. So from June, say, um, I'll take, um, it could be 1,200, hopefully by now it'll be a bit more, so maybe like 1,500 copies of your magazine. Um, every single copy that you send to me, I'll pay you for, um, because so most magazines um, are run on sale or return, so they'll go out to shops, and if 60% don't sell, then they, what the shops do is basically rip the cover off um, and post the covers back to prove that they didn't sell. So that's just you. You know, you've just wasted sixty percent of what you, you know, what you made. Um, so it's a really precarious process, and also it takes ages to get the money back. So you can be waiting six months for the money to come in from the shops, during which time you can fold because you run out of money. So with Stack, I say it's guaranteed. You know, I'll pay you for everything that I take. Um, I'll pay you as soon as the magazines hit the warehouse, so next day basically. But for all that. Um, I can pay around 160 to 2 pounds per copy, depending on weight and other stuff. Um, for some magazines, that is basically what they'd get from retailers anyway, yeah, yeah. and they're fine with that. For other magazines, it's not. But for almost all magazines, if you consider it as a run-on, so, so say they're going to print their May issue anyway, mm. and I say, okay, just add 1,500 onto the end. The plates are all made up, exactly. Yeah. The, there are very few mags for whom like two pounds per copy will not cover print costs. So it's, you know, I'm, I'm very careful to sort of explain all this up front and yeah. say, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to rip you off here. Like, you know, this, this is sort of how it works. But, it, and I think it's important to try to think around the systems a bit like that because, yeah, you know, you, you make a magazine, you just want to get it out there. You don't want to start building a whole new system, you know, from the ground up. You just, you just want people to enjoy what you've made. So that's kind of where I sort of come yeah. in. I mean, I think that's uh, it's very positivist view. <laughs> I think I, I mean I think the industry is a little bit more tricky than that in certain areas, but I think it is always good in, to in that respect. Well, just but like um, I think that the profit margins do on a certain level. The profit margins require a certain level of um, uh, advertising, things like that, and actually the the actual over the counter sales aren't necessarily the most important thing for a magazine anyway. For, for most of the independents I work with, advertising can certainly play a part, but again, it's, it comes down, down to how they're set up. You know, if you, if you look at uh, commercial, most commercial magazines will have a sales team 
that is as big or bigger yeah. than the editorial team. Most independent magazines, if anyone's selling advertising, it's the editor, like yeah. you know, sort of like in his spare time. So the so ad sales aren't as important, and that's not to say they shouldn't be, because actually, if a lot of independent magazines realised what they had, they could really commercialise that. But um, but yeah, it's just not really. That's not the situation. I mean, is that a space you think that you could actually provide? I mean, you could in. In theory, ad stack could have advertising attached to it rather than attached to individual magazines. Yeah, a, a, a lot of people have said to me, like, kind of, why don't you set up like stack agency? And then, you know, kind of when uh, I don't know, like Amiga watches want to reach a certain demographic of people that, and it just sounds like such a massive hassle. And I don't have enough time for doing what I'm doing anyway. Yeah. So I, I'm not as interested in that yeah. side of things. Well, it's both kind of interesting a bit about the weather sort of. Slightly more uncomfortable sides of the business come in. It's like exactly, because exactly. the logic is sitting around the pub. It's like oh, but you could make a, you could make a million do that. <laughs> of course, the reality of it isn't necessarily the same. Yeah. And I think it's important to remember that actually people do what they do for reasons of passion and yeah. and interest. And, and also, if if you look at the, I mean, you know, look at the advertising market at the moment. It looks like a pretty horrible place to be, from what I can tell. You know, I, I'm I'm certainly much happier with Stack being a thing where, you know, I make like I aim to make a pound on every magazine that goes out. So I'm getting my money in from like you know, 1,200 people all around the world. Mm -hmm. That feels like a much more secure place to be than if I've got one advertiser who I have to please, and and if I don't please them, they're going to pull the plug. You know, there it's it, I, I'm just happier with it that way, basically. Yeah. I mean, the publishing down is because it's interesting as well. Or it's always been balanced between being turning it into a, an institution or an organisation, or keeping it running as a sort of cobbled together jalopy. Um, uh, partly because of those things, I feel like we could, we actually wouldn't do it anything more. Yeah. If we bolted on all the other institutional requirements, we would. The difference it would make is that we, we who are running it, would start to get paid, and at the moment that's not really. I mean, we get money in and, and spend it on the project in another way, but you know, uh, which sounds pretty much what you do. Right? Ultimately, <laughs> you're still you're still working with that economy. But I think uh, um, it, it's it, interesting it, to try and have to make that decision. Yeah, I suppose. About, it is. Well, what what what's the result of deciding to professionalise yourself. Yeah. So did, did you actually want to deal with that or yeah. keep things on a certain I, I think the, the big difference for me is that I'm you know, I have customers and and I have to, you know, present a professional service to these customers. People, you know, you can't take it lightly. People pay, especially yeah. overseas, they pay a decent amount of money to have these magazines yeah. sent to them. And I do my best, but you know, kind of when yeah. you do another job as well, it kinda of, and and honestly there've been times when I mean, it was like late at night, and I'm sitting in front of a computer rather than doing something that I'd rather be doing. And you just think, like, why am I why bother? Why am I doing this? And the, you know, this idea that in the future, it, and actually now, I, I, I'm at that stage now. I do that in business hours rather than at this other time. Yeah. Whereas I think, from what I've seen at Publishing the Damned, you've got, you know, trestle tables go out in a space, people come in with all of their great things they've made and you have a fantastic experience and it goes away. Yeah. So it's it, it's more, for me it's to do with giving customers That's true, experience. I suppose you've got to uh, I mean I think we should have more of an ongoing obligation, not necessarily to our public or uh, but the equivalent of our subscribers rather than customers I suppose, or the people who actually take part and I would I don't feel like we do that particularly well, I mean it's, uh, it's something that sort of ends up falling off but we, we don't have that periodic requirement to sort of send something out on a monthly basis yeah. you know we appear and disappear yeah. more like a carnival than a yeah than a sort of a, what would the equivalent be I don't know okay you get the idea you get the metaphor <laughs> without me finishing it but um, also that hit and run mentality is much a, a lot of that comes from these observations about you were saying about the returns of the magazines. I used to regularly go to the bins of the magazine, of the of bookshop stops and the shops and things, because you just go and get mm. the latest magazine. The magazines that have just come off the shelves yeah. for free without the cover. 
which yeah. means the news you... agent down the road from our office just leaves them stacked up outside. So, you, uh, and which you know, fair play to him. But yeah. I'd rather people came along and like picked up six copies of magazines for free than they just yeah. got. Yeah, exactly. And, and that kind of distribution, I suppose, is the type that actually really interests me when it's lost. The control has been lost. Mm. Um, and in some ways, what you're doing is enacting that loss of control in a particular way. Like the, the magazines themselves couldn't have, can't control what you've selected. And that one thousand hit is a one-off yeah. kind of. It's a controlled, <laughs> it's controlled yeah. loss of control. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, but also that fact that they are material and in and sort of out there, and you can pick up something that never have any access to, mm. which can be hyper-specialised. Mm. Makes me think of the bits in Have I Got News For You, where they always have that w the weird yeah. magazine of the week. Yeah. But the fact those things exist, I think, is, is actually one of the most interesting parts of contemporary culture for me, that actually have these extremely nerdy discourses going on with but what they represent is an enthusiasm for something. But and, and that's where the internet's making a difference because so it's those publications. It's like you know, exactly. uh, like you know, Ferris Metals Monthly or something like that. They're you know they they're falling off quicker than you can count mm. because the fact is that you know you can get every you get all the information there yeah, yeah. online, um, and so there's kind of no reason to print. I think I think people get kind of caught up with this like idea that when you put ink on a piece of paper some like fairy dust gets sprinkled on as well and like, this, therefore something magical and special. And you've actually got to fight against that and say, well, no, just focus on the ones that are special and what, ma what is it that makes them special? Yeah. You know, the, nobody has a, a, a right to print uh, you know, a, and, and, and find an audience. Yeah. But it, like you say, it does seem, <coughs> it's got going back to that thing of it, the, the understanding of the, the materiality of, of the look of something is has a role to play. In the oh, absolutely, yeah. 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 We drifted so. off. Let's turn it around and sort of, because I, I, the, the main reason I want to come do this is to like, talk to you, basically. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm interested in, because I, I know how I got into independent magazines, but what was it that got you into zines? Um, well, partly about reading them, partly trying to publish them, and then realising that I had nowhere to put them. And so, the first direct, well, I actually took over part of Blue Magazine. I, we, like, I was ah, doing that. I, right. That's how I know about that story. It's kind of a bit of a weird insider story. And that was, I wasn't editing it, but I was like contributing to it. I was a student union vice president and stuff, and I made it far more, um, Dry and student. -y. You took away the erections. Yeah, I totally basically. took away all the erections and the <laughs> celebrities and the. Uh, uh, it, well, I didn't, but it was it was moving in that direction. It was because it was under control by that point. But um, uh, so uh, that's what started me interested. I was like doing a few artist books. I started as an artist, and um, so publishing was there. And I never really, but I never really wanted to enter the industry. I was mm. more interested in that material side, I suppose, and. Um, then, when I ended up as a curator rather than an artist or whatever, uh, it was the only area I could actually produce artworks in, or present artworks in, that I could do without backing. Mm. So, I was being paid like a stupid amount of money to be a consultant, which on like an art consultant, which was just laughable. I mean, I, I did nothing. I mean, absolutely nothing, because they, the client didn't want me to do anything. What they wanted was to come, sorry, this is a bit of a detour, but what they wanted me to do was to commission the artist that they'd already decided on. Right. And what and it and the consultancy was effectively the way that they could say to their staff that they consulted people, consulted an expert. So for a year, I did this like one day a week, being paid like at the time what seemed like a vast amount of money. For, I mean, it was a couple of hundred quid a day, which, like, as a recent graduate, seems huge. I felt really guilty about it, both because I wasn't really doing anything for this money, and on the other hand, um, like, everybody else seemed to be sort of struggling around to find paid work. I couldn't find anywhere to do creative projects. So I thought, ah, oh, publishing, I can do that. So I commissioned some just, like, very simple uh, comic book 
I mm. stuff from artists that I knew. And um, I ended up with stacks of stuff, not knowing what to do with it. Because suddenly you've got like thousands of these bits of paper, <coughs> and you don't know how to get rid of them. And, um, and so that became sort of like a question that was, uh, it's like, well, I'm really interested in this material, but if I do it on my own in this way, I actually just end up with piles of paper. That, um, and, and actually, not I really need to think about how to get that to other people. Mm. And that's literally how my involvement started. It was sort of a weird, oh, right, that didn't really work. I'll move on to the next thing. And um, so, yeah, there was, it was a kind of trying to find a space where I was still able to do some material things, mm. like design stuff. I actually really enjoy working with design software. I don't really want to be a designer. Mm. And I enjoy working with text, but I don't necessarily want to specialise um, in being an editor. And I like working with artists, but I don't really mind how. And so it, it was just trying to find a space that worked. And so the, the questions, I, I'm always better at solving other people's problems than my own. So there was obviously a big problem there. And so we thought, well, it's more, it was easier to raise public money to bring loads of people together mm. who publish than it was to raise any money at all to distribute this mm. material back out. There was no support for the distribution. So we just thought, well, but if we can get money to bring people together, then they can take it away with them. So it's very simple um, convention kind of mentality. And some of that grows out of, like, I went to a wonder con, and like, I've always read comics still do so um, I went to WonderCon which is like the opposite of independent I mean it's so corporate the <coughs> kind of whole Marvel DC mm. comic book scene but it's still entirely fan run mm. and uh, so even on a very large scale the WonderCon which is like the second largest there in San Francisco for sort of comic book and sci-fi enthusiasts was like amazing I'm like I'm just this weird event where everyone's in fancy dress and like you know, you just talk to anybody about anything. And, um, you could find Filipino comic books from the 1950s about domestic violence next to, like, the Green Lantern premiere. It was, uh, and, and I, I liked that spirit. And, mm. that, and it was media, it was all mediated through passage of magazines. It was, you know, the, they require, they're required in order to break the geeky silence, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they, uh, they actually functioned as a communication tool, but not what was written inside them. And so you, so you sort of want to bring some of that into what you do now. So if, well, people, yeah. if people were to come tomorrow, how do they see some of that spirit reflected? Well, I think it just happened, there's two ways that it's been sort of enacted. One is that it's so short that everybody has to come at the same time. Mm. So it's more like thinking of it. If you have a party, everybody comes. If you have an open house for a weekend, you or you have like two guests at a time, but they're constantly there, and and so actually it seemed more economic and more energetic to do it in this intensity way. Mm -hmm. So and and so that kind of creates something, um, and also people start turning up in fancy dress as if they were a science fiction <laughs> thing anyway. So there'd probably be somebody dressed weirdly. <laughs> and uh, last year when we were here, we tried to enact some kind of other sides to it so we did a launch event at the end of the and at the end of the day which was like rapid fire so each magazine or publisher had 10 minutes with me asking them questions and each one instead of having wine and beer was a shot of tequila <laughs> uh, so there's a sort of slightly dysfunctional performance so it, like looking at different bits of the publishing industry, I suppose. Like, there's the launch and what happens when you have alcohol and people get together. What if you take that to sort of like a dysfunctional extreme? Yeah. And, and I think a lot of those are kind of a part of the spirit. I mean, I think, you, and oddly, we were talking about exactly what you do. Like, loads of publishing you damned activity as well, like to solve that distribution. Mm. Like, sending by post something that's worth 50p is not viable, but if you put 20 together that were worth 50p, 50p that becomes viable mm. and um, that there could be some kind of distribution structure there but um, your, sort of, your approach was slightly, probably slightly more logical <laughs> 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 we never managed to do this in the end I have to say and so there's many publishing me down projects that haven't have ever happened yet oh maybe we could collaborate we'll, we'll get together yeah, and yeah. find a way of uh, getting scenes we could do one month which is just a 
bag full of publishing me down stuff. That, I actually, would, that would shock some of you. I, I did. Um, I did like <laughs> do you know? Uh, do you know Zine Swap? There's a, a, a group called. I don't know if they're doing it now, but a couple of years ago, I met up with these fellas uh, who called themselves Zine Swap, where basically you, as zine makers, uh, they <coughs> zines send it into like a central like location, and then they just like sent them back out. Yeah. So if you so if you made something, you got something. Yeah, okay. And the idea was that it was okay. sort of like circulate like that. We, we did one time where they kind of got together a bunch of zines, and I sent it out in stack. It's like because I, I often send like free extra things, so like posters or newspapers or zines or whatever. But the problem is now we're at like twelve hundred. You know, yeah, zine print run would be three hundred. Exactly, so like, exactly. That's why yeah. I was curious about the economic. That's there's a massive economic difference there between people who are like the zine, which is really not about. It's really about communication mainly mm. you know, and, and producing something. And then this other level, which is sort of starting to go well, perhaps this could actually function as a as something that supports me as well as yeah. as well as I pour everything into it. And publishing down for me is still the thing that I pour stuff, time, and energy into mm. in my spare time, which I think is important because most of the pro productions are like that as well. Yeah, they're like things done on the edge of everything. What sort of core of what people do. Mm. Um, and I think that's a tricky thing generally for people in the world. Is like when does your passion become your profession? Because I think sometimes it's quite good to keep them apart. <laughs> like in life. Yeah. In like go back to a holistic thing. I must have like done some yoga or something by it. <laughs> um, uh, but I think there is a danger of taking it out of the sort of amateur into the professional because there's something potentially gets lost in the raising of those stakes. You start by, the, the danger is you have to start playing by other people's rules, I think. And that's, I think a lot of the magazines that you're distributing are on that, that, that fine balance, really, mm. that they might reach a level of success that requires them then to start going, well, we have to start following these particular mo like standardized yeah. marketing models, because <coughs> the whole distribution and consumption circuits are geared towards that, and, they, and, and anything outside that they just can't support. The, the more common way it goes is that you'll get a, a group of people making a magazine or something that you know gets some attention, and then brands and things will kind of start coming around, so can you make something for me? And that's great news because then some money comes in off the back yeah. of it, but then you hire some people in order to service that client, and then you've got <coughs> staff, and then you need to keep on bringing the work in, and so then you end up, or you can end up doing the work that actually you never wanted to yeah, do yeah, in the first exactly. place just to, <laughs> to keep things going. But I think, you know, the, the, the savvy publisher has that in mind and, and finds ways to make sure it doesn't happen. Yeah. Should we ask yeah, if anyone ask any questions? We've got a quarter of an hour. Incredible time. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it was an I think we've got a... And what's the volatility? Like how many new ones each month? How, how many disappear? Uh, well, independent magazines do have a habit of dying. They, they do tend to drop off. Um, I think we've got about 20 magazines on at the moment. Um, and there could be way more. But I'm quite careful because, you know, I, I want, when someone signs up, I want them to see the pool of magazines and have a reasonable chance that they'll actually get one of those in the coming year. So... Um, so yes, I, I think 20 is like sort of about the fighting way. That's, that's about right. In terms of new stuff, um, yeah, it's, it's a balance. You know, the, I'd say that probably about one in four that we send out will be a, a totally new one. So something that has never come before. But we, I only send out any magazine once in 12 months. So if you receive a magazine as part of a year subscription, you won't get that magazine again, basically. How do you, how do you come across the new then? Because I, uh, it, it has the feeling of you being browsing and being able to like make a selection. And, yeah. But obviously, with new magazines, somebody must be coming to you to say, do you, "Are you finding that people are looking towards you as a possible?" Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I, my desk at the moment is, I mean, at the moment always has a stack of magazines like that, and they just constantly make me feel bad because 
I know people have sent them in and I need to find the time yeah. to go away and actually read them. Yeah, yeah. I don't. Um, so <laughs> I do, I do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, the, in, in the old days, so when I first started, it was me, I mean, Borders existed then, so I'd go to Borders and I'd go to record shops and bookshops and things like that. Um, these days, I still go magazine shopping, like, you know, kind of every few weeks. But the majority of the the really interesting stuff tends to come direct to me because it's not made it into shops and yeah. stuff. So they're looking for another outlet. Exactly. Yeah. So I was just wondering now that your your audience is growing, you have a thousand two hundred subscribers. Is it? Do you think it could become an issue that you'd like to commission a magazine, but that's too small to produce that amount of magazines, and therefore you would have to maybe help? Um, no, because the so the, the money that I pay to publishers, um, it, as, as I said before, it pretty much always will be enough to cover the cost of print. So, it, so if the, the idea with Stack is that um, it, it always was that it could scale. So if you know this video goes up on YouTube and I have 5,000 subscribers next month, that's fine because I'll be able to order and pay for 5,000 magazines. So the, so it's not kind of, it, well, the idea is that it won't reach that point where it just can't be done. The, I mean, what I'd have to make sure of, <clears throat> at the moment, everything is done very kind of informally, <coughs> you know, emails to me and stuff. I guess when it reaches that point, there might have to be some kind of like contract comes in where like, I promise I will pay, you know, the, and, and give it stuff, but I don't see it being a problem. I mean, in some ways it could actually save the magazine. Because of, because of that, I mean, so the sudden bell curve mm. lift for one month could actually rescue something. Well, so because uh, because we're able to um, able to we have to plan things in so far in advance, it means that a magazine will know that, for example, I don't know, I could talk about their May issue, but like their May issue um, will be going out to this much bigger audience, and so then if they are talking to advertisers, you know, they can sort of talk that up, and, and you know, so that can. So that can basically help to sort of like plump up the figures like that. I mean, I, I'm curious to know because it, it would be also possible, presumably, to flip Stack into being a magazine itself, a magazine about a magazine. <laughs> said. If if you built more editorial, in, I mean, the magazine being online and then the distribution having a different function. Yeah. I'm well, the, the the thing that I've um, so I. <clears throat> First of all, I'm never going to make a magazine because I've, <laughs> <laughs> I've seen far too many of them. Publishers never make the money, but distributors do. Exactly. exactly yeah. um, oh well, and also I'm, I'm lucky because I, I, you know, I get paid to be a writer and editor. So I, I've made a bunch of magazines, and I've never had to risk my own money for it. But um, what I, what I am really interested in these days is the web and how the web helps with this because there's this constant, um, you know, people put print and digital in opposing camps uh, and assume that one's going to kill the other, digital's not going to print, kill print. And of course that's not the case, you know, the, the two should work together. Um, <clears throat> and when I started Stack, I um, set up a Facebook um, account and set up a Twitter, just because I sort of thought, actually because I thought it looked good to have the badges on the homepage, it sort of made you look a bit proper if you had like a Facebook and a Twitter on there. Um, and it didn't really know what to do with them. Um, and then, like, you know, literally years later, probably about two years later, I finally clicked what Twitter was for. And, and when, uh, you can laugh now, but it was, two, it was years ago, so, you know. Um, and and so, so Twitter now is the way that I stay in touch with publishers and with customers and just with people generally. Yeah. That's what that's for. Facebook, literally up until a few weeks ago, <coughs> didn't know what to do with it. You know, I'd sort of like put event launches up there sometimes and nothing really happened. And, and I was at a talk um, by a guy called Douglas McCabe um, from Enders Analysis, which is like a media um, analysts firm. And he basically showed this slide of how um, the, the amount of time and money that people spend reading printed magazines is just doing this, so it's only going that way. And the amount of time and money people spend on the web is only doing this. And it sort of, I mean, it, obviously everyone knows anyway, but it brings home the fact that if you're going to make print work, you have to be doing it in a way that works with digital. Add into that fact that most people know, well, lots of people going on the web with their mobiles now, the stack site isn't mobile optimized. 
and I realized that Facebook is essentially this free mobile optimized site that I've got. So now if magazines are this kind of slow pleasure where you know you sort of like you take it away, you sit down and spend half an hour reading it, and the opposite of that is Facebook on your phone, which is like you know 30 seconds while you're in the queue in the sandwich shop. So what I try to do with the Facebook page now is take that slow pleasure and distill it and give it to people in like little 30 second bursts. Hopefully enough to kind of get them interested in what's there. Um, so that I think, so while I'm never going to become a content producer in terms of making magazines, I'm really, really interested in being a content producer in terms of digital stuff. So, yeah, the magazines you subscribe, do they, they see the peak when you buy from them? Do they see another peak afterwards when people resubscribe to them? <clears throat> I'm really, really careful um, not to overpromise with this. The, the, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, the, I mean, I wouldn't say it's a peak. Uh, I mean, you know, the 1,200 people is tiny. It's, it's such a small number of, you know, if you, if you think of like the percentage of 1,200 who are going to go out and, and then like, subscribe, what I know is that, so, you know, again, Twitter is fantastic for this. People like sort of will say, oh, great, I've got the right journal. I love it. I've just subscribed. And so that's this great anecdotal piece of evidence. The publishers do also say, like, you know, kind of, there's, um, there's sort of, a, there's a bit of a group of magazines growing up now, of like, Little White Lies, Boats, Delayed Gratification, that they're, they're independents, but they're starting to kind of get a bit more traction. And I mentioned Delayed Gratification and Boat because the editors of that have both said to me that they basically, they think the reason that they're getting asked to go and do all these things is because they're on stack. And I've said them out a few times now. It's, sort of, it's this like validating kind of process. So yes, it helps, but um, it's not going to suddenly turn anyone's fortunes around massively. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I could call it the best one I've ever seen, but a magazine that I loved uh, was a magazine called Zembla, um, which was, it came out for a couple of years in probably like 2002 to 4, um, and it was a literary magazine that was made like a kind of style magazine, like a fashion magazine, um, and it was just fantastic. The the team who made that now make a magazine called Ports, um, and you can see a lot of the same kind of influences in there. But they, they did like weird stuff, like they got Bruce Robinson's, uh, like, how old was she at the time, 15 year old daughter to interview him, and so you got this thing of like, you know, Bruce Robinson and like the, everything you'd expect to find out about that, but also that he walks around naked at home too much and like she really wishes that he wouldn't. And, they'd, yeah, and they'd, they'd like interview dead writers and they'd have this regular feature where um, they'd show the different book covers, so one book, the different covers from all around the world and basically like comment on like sort of what that meant. About. Oh no, sorry, they got the author to comment on what they thought about the different covers from around the world. Really innovative, clever, fun, that's the sort of thing that I get interested in. Yeah, I, I'm not somebody who answers the question very well because I don't have a, I'm not, I, I'm always distracted. So the, the things that have caught my eye that I just thought were so peculiar and interesting are um, Girls and Corpses, which is a, um, basically a sort of spoof of Playboy, but with zombies. Um, or, uh, well, I used magazine that was kind of in a bit more commercially available than that one uh, was Butt Magazine that I thought was really innovative and it kind of, it reached a certain level but now it's sort of morphed into Fantastic Man which is sort of the more, well it was so, spe Butt was so specialised as a sort of queer cultural magazine that like um, Fantastic Man's attempting to be a little bit more broad I suppose. Uh, but I still think that certain editorial there is really good, and so um, Fantastic Man, in terms of sort of more mainstream available publishing, Fantastic Man and Gentlewoman, I think, are, are still really Gentleman high, still super great. high quality yeah. um, editorial design. <coughs> uh, you know, right kind of focus. 
And they've got Beyonce on the cover this issue. I mean, that's insane. It's insane. Yeah. They, then they had Angela Lansbury on the last one, and now they've got Beyonce. Yeah. What a lineup. Yeah. Get them in the same <laughs> <laughs> So, I'm going to uh, South by Southwest um, next week, and I'm going there because I want to find out about you know what's coming up in publishing next. Um, and I was thinking about what I could do to sort of distill all of this because I'm planning to be massively inspired while I'm there. I want to come back and make something. Um, <coughs> and so I've tracked down a few platforms that I'm going to try and use. So there's a, a thing called Stampsy, which is essentially a really stripped down InDesign that you use on an iPad to, to, to make um, a magazine, which you sort of like flip through like this. So I'll be experimenting with that. There's one called um, uh, Tapestry, um, which is for making little short tap stories on your iPhone, which is, as you tap the screen, it sort of like brings more text kind of thing. And I'm really interested in how something like that, so I'm, I'm not a designer, I come from a, a writing background. What will I, end up doing that with that. Will I make a lot of crap? You know, will, will, the, will the, the different formats make me tell the story? So, well, they definitely will make me tell it slightly differently. Will the story change as a result of, of that? These are the things that I'm, I'm interested in. So I think, yeah, probably there's a risk that there's a lot of crap that comes out of the result, but that's not to so say you shouldn't do it. You know, the, you, you should sort of see what, see what you could do with it. I mean, I... Not sure. Uh, I mean, I think the Vanity Press was always there, really, if you wanted yeah. to find it. I think that the, you know, the, the, and also with those systems, it kind of relies on people actually buying it. I mean, you, I think there's a lot of the time it's dangerous producing things, and those give the illusion of having produced something. And you can print 10 copies and look at it and go, look, I produced a <coughs> book, but nobody else has ever bothered reading it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm more the, those online sort of opportunities I'm more interested in, like really simple ones like Scribed, you upload it, people can have it. And like that kind of uh, accepting that if you want to do that, that you probably shouldn't be necessarily putting it out in um, a commercial setting, but actually just more interest. If you want to speak, then speak and don't expect someone to mm. purchase your speech, I suppose. And I think that's possibly what you meant by nobody has the right to publish in that sense of like, everybody obviously has the right to speak, but to expect that people should listen exactly. necessarily, then you need to go to that next level, which is actually consider what you're doing yeah. and, and consider the thing with some level of objectivity. Exactly. And imagine what other people might do. An interesting, so you know, this is kind of like future stuff, but so at the moment there's a thing called MagCloud, um, where you can like make your magazine and then it prints on demand. Um, and so, so you don't have to print in advance. People can just like print it if they want it. it it's not very nice, you know. They like they all end up looking a bit like a corporate brochure. This, uh, but, and I'm absolutely sure that the technology will change, and pretty soon we will have that kind of print-on-demand uh, capability to make something that looks and feels really special. And so then, kind of, you know. When that happens, the the whole kind of like you know, no one has the right to publish. Well, that absolutely remains. You know, no no one has the right for anyone else to care about what you've done. But the the actual financial barrier will be effectively taken away. So, um, and, but again, I'm, you know, I'm really interested in the crap. You know, the, I I I I wouldn't necessarily buy it and keep it myself. But I think even the crap that comes out is is an interesting thing. You know, what are people interested in? Professional. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Cheers.